to ask, um, let me see, Senator Spicho for, you're right, an adoption of an, of an agenda before we pray for the day. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I move that we adopt the session agenda dated August 23rd, 2013. Objection. There's an objection. Please raise your hand. All in favor for to adopt the, the session agenda. The governor has called us into session, okay. uh, Madam votes Speaker. Ordered. Can I ask then, uh, Senator Duenas, if you can lead us in prayer? I would be I would be happy to, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to convene as a body, even though more than likely we did so wrong because maybe the governor's call to session should have been first, but notwithstanding any other provision of law, I guess, is where we're at, then Lord, we ask now that you continue to bless uh, this session, and hopefully it doesn't continue to be like this, but we will do the people's business, and we thank you, God, for, for blessing all of us and giving us this distinct honor and opportunity to come before this body and deliberate on the matters that are important to the people of Guam, especially the budget for our people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins, our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Senator. And Senator Adda, if you can lead us with a recitation of the Indifresi. And I would like if Senator Morrison, you can lead us in singing the uh, Guam hymn in Chamorro and the national anthem. If Senator Munya Barnes, you can lead us.
Thank you very much, Senators. Can I have the clerks to please take roll call? Senator Uggen. Vice Speaker Cruz. Present. Senator Duenas. Yes. Senator Limtiaco. Senator McCready. Here. Senator Morrison. Present. Senator Munya Barnes. Yes. Senator Pangolinan. Here. Senator Respicio. Present. Senator Rodriguez. Here. Senator Snicholas. Present. Speaker Wampat. Senator Yamashita. Yeah. Madam Speaker, there is a quorum. Thank you. Senator Respicio, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that we approve the legislative journal dated August 21st uh, through August 22nd, 2013, subject to correction. Okay, no objection, so we're good. Madam Speaker, there are communications and petitions, and I move that they be pending the day's session journal. As well as uh, messages from Imagala and Guahan, I move that they be penned a session journal. Okay. So ordered. Madam Speaker, as well as um, any standing committees, uh, reports from standing committees be penned a session journal. So ordered. And there are no reports of um, select committees. Uh, so under item 12, introduction and first reading of bills and resolution, so I'll ordered. move that bill numbers 173-32 uh, LS be given its first reading. So ordered as well as resolution number 206-32 LS also be given its first reading. Okay, so ordered. And certificate number 54-32 uh, LS be given its first reading. So ordered. And uh, certificate number 55-32 COR also be given its first reading. So ordered. And under motions, my first motion is that um, any resolution of congratulatory or condolence in nature that's introduced for the duration of this session period that it be adopted and that uh, all senators be co-sponsors and that the sponsors work with the legal counsel and the clerk in the preparations of these documents. Okay, so ordered. And um, Madam Speaker, um, I listened very carefully to the prayer being offered by a member of uh, our body and the, just to assuage uh, his concerns and maybe to answer um, his prayer to say it was never um, our attempt to um, usurp the authority of the governor in his uh, call to a special session uh, today. But understanding the chronology of events, you certainly do have the authority as the speaker uh, to call us into session, provided that you give us a uh, two-hour notice, which you've satisfied that requirement. And so in the case of the governor, I believe that uh, we received his notice at 12.37 uh, p.m. for a 1 p.m. call to session. And uh, right now, the bill's been introduced and that photocopies are being made. And so we can do one of two things. We can proceed with this agenda, or we could see where we're at with the uh, photocopying of that uh, document, which I believe is about 70, 70 some pages, right? Um, maybe the clerk can ask where we're at with that. Yes. Can one of you, Sergeant Arms, to see how, uh, where we are with the Xeroxing of the bill? Halfway. Okay, so um, Madam, Madam Speaker, in the interest of uh, time and given that uh, we are in a session and soon to be a special session, uh, and then I defer to our preparations chair for uh, item five under motions. Senator Speaker Pangolinan, you recognize. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, as you know, this legislature passed a budget bill uh, that provided for the operations of the Government of Guam for fiscal year 2014. And the governor uh, has threatened to veto the bill. And um, if it's one promise he kept, uh, he kept his promise to veto the bill. And I thank him for keeping his promises. Uh, but notwithstanding then, Madam Speaker, the veto of the governor, I would like to make a motion that vetoed Bill 38-32 COR, an act making appropriations for the operation of the executive, legislative, 
and judicial branches of the government of Guam for fiscal year ending September 30, 2014, and making other appropriations and establishing miscellaneous and administrative provisions that the Bill 38-32 be placed in the voting file for the purpose of an override, and I would like to discuss the matter. Objection, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we thought there was a, once again a gentleman's agreement that we were going to go into session just for the purposes of waiting for the bill that's being produced that the governor had sent to us. Now we're acting in, spe in special session or in, in your call to session when the governor has called us into session, Madam Speaker. So I believe on special session, I believe we have to dispose of the governor's there matter are, that he's put before us, an and then we can move to the... Senator, let me address then your objection. Uh, there is uh, then an objection, yes, for the motion that is being uh, proffered by Speaker Pangilinan, so therefore I'm going to call for the vote. Yes. I would like to also, Madam Speaker, get a parliamentary ruling on why this is the proper way to proceed Senator, as per the governor's call to session and us now trying to dispose of this issue. Senator, as uh, the majority leader had basically informed everyone here and the public, of course, and in giving the chronology of the events that took place today, that I had called session since 1030 for, to meet at 1. The governor submitted a letter that arrived down here at about 12.30, calling us into session at 1 o'clock. And so we are in a regular session. He did speak with you, indicating that the bill that was sent by the governor was introduced, and it is currently at re uh, the reproduction room being uh, reproduced. There's about 70-some pages. And prior to recognizing uh, Speaker Pangilinan is that we are still halfway through the Xeroxing of of course, of, of the, the bill that the governor have submitted. And at this point in time, then what we would do is that when it's ready, as the majority leader had stated, is that then we would recess. Madam Speaker, I, I have asked for a parliamentary ruling, Madam Speaker. I believe this is not proper as per law, and I believe that we have to dispose of the governor's matter that he has brought us into. But if you want to do the chronology based on your call to session and, and the hours and the time, that's fine. But we're in our session now, and the governor can call us into session even when we're well, in session. So, so Senator, the minority there is would like to get objection. a ruling on that. Uh, Madam Speaker, yes. I'm going to ask that the gentleman exercise some decorum and at least give you the respect to finish what it is that you're saying. We're not playing by jungle rules here. So at least give her that opportunity to finish what she's saying. And as I proceeded, and as, as I said earlier, and to try to give, to be reasonable with everybody here, is that give a chronology of where we're at, and you didn't let me finish, and that was relayed to you earlier prior to starting the session, that even the majority leader had paused, asking the clerk to check with Repro if they have completed the reproduction of the bills, and they're not ready. And a regular session can stop, yes, and recess, to then go into a special session. And that's exactly what we would do when the bills are ready, when the, the copies have been made, the messages have been made, then we would recess to go into a special session. So we're not, I'm not pulling anything out of the ordinary here. And that is within reasonable time, closest to the time in which the governor has called us into session. And I am keeping it within a reasonable time. And since you're objecting, though, then I will call for the vote. I maintain my objection, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So then, hearing the, that there is an objection, to be able to allow Speaker Pangilinan to continue with his motion, will all those be in favor, please? Yes, there is. Your objection is to his motion. Is that correct? OK. Yes, Speaker uh, Pangilinan's uh, motion. So. So, 
there is an objection then. So all in favor then of uh, Speaker Pangilinan with his motion, notwithstanding then the objections of Malaga and Guahan, to then place vetoed bill in the voting file. Please raise your hand. Okay, then the motion, I mean, uh, the motion made, and um, the objection, of course, fell, and the motion for Speaker Pangilinan prevailed. Speaker Pangilinan, you're recognized. It's in the voting file. It's in the voting file, yes. Thank you. Oh, you wanted to discuss it? That? Yeah. Madam Speaker. No, I, my, my motion wait, was. Yes, but his motion was to, um, wait, 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 guys. It gets okay. close to the voting file wait, and it's, then it's a motion that you say first you of all. the motion. And he did say to discuss, to be placed in the, on the voting file, but he wants to discuss it. Right. And that was his motion. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as you know, the governor in his veto message outlined certain concerns with regards to the budget bill, basically, for FY 2014. Uh, the governor is claiming that the problems that he found with the bill are such things as the fact that Bill 38-32, the appropriations are lower than the fiscal year 2013 appropriation. I believe the governor is misleading everyone because what he is using in his analysis is the FY 2013 appropriation level without reducing the $14 million or over $8 million that was deappropriated, which went to tax refunds. If you recall, we passed a budget in FY 2013 and then we deappropriated $14 million in order to make up the difference for the shortfall in the provision for refunds. And so when the governor is saying that this bill, 38-32, provides less resources, he's starting from, from, the D, from the full appropriation and not the deappropriation. And so when you have to kind of take a look at exactly the numbers that he's using, because he loves you know, to try and figure these things out, and I certainly admire him trying to figure it out, but certainly don't admire the results of what he's trying to do. And so, Madam Speaker, what I think he is trying to do, of course, is mislead the people. The most glaring thing for me, Madam Speaker, is the governor continues to insist that he's vetoing this bill because we're providing too much money for tax refunds. Madam Speaker, let me ask you this. When has this government provided too much money for tax refunds? Madam Speaker. It never has, Madam Speaker. We have made the appropriations and the provisions based upon revenue uh, numbers that are and payouts of income tax refunds that are required by law. And when that lawful calculation is required to be performed by Director of Revenue and Taxation, he really has no choice but to do it as called for by statute, and that is the figure that really that should be set aside by by, uh, by the legislature, by statute. So when the, when the Director of Revenue and Taxation did his job by statute, required by statute, and performed the calculation, he determined that what was required to be set aside was $129 million. And the governor keeps insisting that that's too much money. And so he has set a provision that has gone from 113 to 107, Madam Speaker. But if you take a look at what has occurred, Madam Speaker, is the governor's kind of talking about fiscal year and not tax year. So that by the time we pay the tax refunds, he's saying, I'm only gonna pay 107. But he's not counting the fact that he has to pay the entire tax year. And so when- Point of order, uh, Madam Speaker. Sorry, Speaker Ben. I I believe that what the gentleman is saying is very important for all members to listen to, and I noticed that our colleagues have walked out. And so I make a notwithstanding the House rules for a call of the House. They need to be here, Madam Speaker. They need to participate in the discussion. They can't just walk out when things don't uh, get their way. So I move for a call of the House. Sergeant and then we can arms. allow the gentleman to proceed Sergeant because what- arms, can you please call the members in? Madam Speaker, I motion to recess. Objection. I don't. 
we're, we're told that we have to meet in session and all of a sudden they either walk out or they call for a recess. Which one is it? Well, Madam okay. Speaker, you allowed the Senator, yes, conversation will, to go on. There was an objection on the floor. And I'm going to call then uh, for a vote for that recess that uh, you're requesting for. Yes, so call all of the members in, please. Sergeant at Arms. We're doing a, earlier had, before that uh, was done. I did call for the uh, call of the house.
this brief, of course, uh, time there was an objection and in terms of, uh, the, you know, the call of the house and uh, we have everybody here and just to entertain it, although I really shouldn't have, but you know, I try to be as fair as possible to everybody and give everyone an opportunity, we'll do this, but uh, preferably though in, in the future, unless, uh, you know, uh, I'll put you down in, in line to, to speak wherever uh, in the order in which you, you raise your hand. But I would just entertain this uh, particular objection then uh, to which is the call by the um, majority leader to have everybody here to give everyone the opportunity uh, to, you know, hear every members. And I think that it's important that we all provide that same respect to each other as we debate and deliberate on an issue. So, Senator Ada, you still want to proceed with uh, your objection then and call for that vote? Yes, Madam Speaker. So then, and, and can you repeat it again one more time what you're objecting to just to make sure then that uh, we do this correctly? It was the um, objection to placing it onto the voting file. Oh, but we, we, we're, we're beyond that. Uh, it was the, it was. Uh, and it was call for recess too, Madam Speaker. Okay, so, that's, so that was it then. It was the call for the recess. So all in favor then uh, for the recess as uh, called uh, by uh, Senator Adda. So n remember now what you're voting for. Okay, <laughs> for the recess. So if you want a recess, raise your hand. Okay, so it failed. So Speaker Pangilinan, please continue. And if you, and if anyone, so I'll put your name down to speak. Is that it, Senator? Okay. Can I go to the bathroom? Oh. You have to say, Mother, may I? <laughs> Speaker Pangilinan, you may thank, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I was, um, uh, trying to uh, impart upon, you know, some of the governor's objections to the bill. One of his objections is that we're setting aside too much money for tax refunds, Madam Speaker. My question to that is, since when has this government set aside too much money to pay tax refunds? Never, Madam Speaker. That's why we had to borrow under this governor $350 million to pay for past due refunds, Madam Speaker. And why? Because when we do the provision, while we do the calculation as required by statute and we come up with a number, what do we do? We just arbitrarily say, we want to reduce that because we want to take that money that should be, should be put aside for tax refunds, that is sufficient to pay for tax refunds. We want to take, take that money aside and pay for the operations of this government. And what occurs is true to form, we don't set aside enough money we spend the money to run the government, and then when it time comes to pay our taxpayers back their refunds, we don't have enough money, and we kind of just let it hang out there, and it's easier to owe the people, Madam Speaker. That's why, Madam Speaker, we had so many people who don't even believe that they're going to get their refunds, so when they get it, they don't come and pick it up because they just can't believe it or else they've moved off island. That's why when we finally were able to clear the backlog of tax refunds, we had over $16 million of checks returned because the people were not here any longer. They hadn't been paid for so long, they've either moved off island, they got married, they changed their address. And so we have checks sitting there now waiting for people to, come up, to, to pick them up, but we don't know how to get in touch with them. And so what's happening, Madam Speaker, is with the borrowing of that money, we're now setting a record of paying on time, paying it in a timely manner, but most importantly because the courts have told us and entered into an order that this government pays its refunds on time. And the only way we can do that, Madam Speaker, with no borrowing capacity left, is to set aside the adequate amount of money, sufficient amount of money, now, the governor's saying we don't need to set aside 129. And I agree. I, I was very adamant at that time, but I looked at where we're at, Madam Speaker, with the payments on a fiscal as well as calendar year basis and tax year basis. And so I was willing to move from 129 down to 120, Madam Speaker, because when we looked at the reports that were filed with the, with the, with the courts, Madam Speaker, 
We've spent and we've paid $103 million of, of tax refunds, Madam Speaker. And according to Reverend Tax, after this latest payment, where we spent $103 million, we have maybe around $19 million left to pay for 2012. So the governor is saying, all I need is 107 or 113. But if you take a look at having paid out $103 million already and having $19 million left, it doesn't add up to 113. It adds up a little above 120, Madam Speaker. And that's why I'm saying, Madam Speaker, that 113 is not enough. And the only reason why the governor wants 113 or 107, depending on which day of the week of it, or whether he's right tongue today or left tongue to, uh, tomorrow, is that he wants that money to spend to increase government operations. The governor's complaining that the appropriation levels for the department and agencies are short this year, Madam Speaker, because of the bill that he sent down, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when we reduce the, opera the operational budget as submitted by the governor for FY 2014, the governor had over $5 million in new higher positions within that budget, Madam Speaker. $5 million of new positions that he wants to increase the cost of this government. He didn't initially want to pay a study. He didn't do that. He wanted to hire new people. And we cut those vacancies, Madam Speaker, because we just don't have the resources if we are going to remain current on our tax refunds. And so we thought that it's better not to hire new people with the exception of the police cycle, which we kept in the budget that we passed. We put in a provision for $800,000 to hire a new police cycle. So we kept that in. We gave additional resources to the Attorney General. Madam Speaker, you heard the Attorney General during his testimony in, in our hearings uh, on, on, on the violent crimes and the victims' rights. So we gave the Attorney General two additional violent, uh, violent crimes prosecutors and a whole team of administrative staff to support those two prosecutors, and we funded victim advocates, two additional provisions for victim advocates. There's where we put our money in, Madam Speaker, when our public is, yet, is screaming about victims' rights not being protected and not being represented, and that's how we responded in this body in this budget, Madam Speaker. And the governor's complaining about that. The governor's saying we don't, he doesn't want that. He vetoes the bill even with a new police cycle, Madam Speaker, all because we cut the vacancies where he can hire new people. So when, he cut, when we cut the vacancies, all of a sudden he wants to pay hay and increase the salaries, and we agreed with him. And the governor said, please, don't touch the set aside of, of the, uh, the, the reserve because I want to pay hay. And when we did that, Madam, and the reserve was at $11 million, or 11.2. So when we did not, when we took the reserve and put it in refunds and still found an opportunity to fund the hay at 10.9, all of a sudden that's too much money. He doesn't want to do it that way. Why, Madam Speaker? Because simply, Madam Speaker, the bill as passed by this body required that the hay be implemented fairly, Madam Speaker. Because we saw what the governor has done, Madam Speaker, with regards to the implementation of the merit bonus. What he did, Madam Speaker, once again, was, un was pick and choose. The Hay plan that he has to submit needs to be fair, and that's all we were asking for. And if he wants to submit an unfair plan, he can do so. It just has to come down to the legislature so there's some checks and balance, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, once again, I know that there are opportunities for other colleagues that may want to speak on the budget, and I won't be that short, but Madam Speaker, what has to occur in any budget passed by this body signed by this governor for me, Madam Speaker, and some of my colleagues here, which I thank for their support, is that we've got to set aside enough provision for refunds. Otherwise, we're going to dig ourselves into the hole of unpaid tax refunds once again, and we're going to have the district court over our heads, Madam Speaker, as we had in the other operations of this government, Madam Speaker. And we can't afford that, much less our public can afford that, our taxpayers cannot afford that. We have to provide enough money. And what 13 is not enough, Madam Speaker, based on what is paid out and what is outstanding. 
Madam Speaker, this government and this governor, I must commend him, has done things like restored the increments. Although he did not fund the increments in the budget he submitted to the legislature, this legislature responded and funded those increments. So when we cut the operations, cut those vacancies, we put that into funding his promise of paying increments in, the, in, this fis in the upcoming fiscal year. Although he did not provide that in his budget, we felt it was our obligation to the employees who have received those increments and should continue to receive them in the next fiscal year. So it's got to have that, Madam Speaker. We got to set aside enough revenue, I mean uh, tax, tax provision, Madam Speaker. And I believe 120 is a reasonable number, having backed off from the 129, Madam Speaker. And our retirees, as we continue to meet the needs of our active employees, our retirees continue to fall behind. We just had an announcement, another 2% on the base rate of GPA. Yet our retirees since 2008 have had no increase at all in their ability and the financial resources provided in their hard years of dedicated work and service to the people of Guam. They've stayed stagnant since 2008. And in when we're restoring the active employees, we're paying past due merit bonuses back to 1991, they're left behind. I think we need to restore their cost of living allowance, Madam Speaker. And it's, it, I, I believe, 1800 going back to 2008, Madam Speaker. They're, we're not paying them retroactive pay or back pay as we are the merit bonuses, Madam Speaker. We're just saying from today forward, you will have today what you had in 2008 to help you meet the increasing cost of your health care, increasing cost of your cost of, of power, food, etc. Your two thousand and eight dollars will, will be restored to you today, even though the inflation has eaten up that value, but it still provides you with more resources than you have. And so, Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to consider these things and ask, the, ask the, for their vote in the override so that we can make these things happen for our people. Increase our salaries for our active employees, provide two thousand and eight dollars in 2014 to help our retirees meet their ever-rising cost of living and provide and ensure that there's sufficient money for our victims and, and the prosecution of violent crimes. And the other issues that will be raised, Madam Speaker, by some of my colleagues with what this budget has done in providing more resources than the governor realizes, than the governor has today, to meet the operational and the service requirements of this government to our people in 2014. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome. On the uh, motion, Senator Mike Snickers, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when I was um, getting myself involved in this budget process, I was very, very happy to be able to take my skills as a former financial advisor, as a former assistant vice president of a local bank, as a licensed investment professional who managed millions of dollars in the private sector, I was so glad to be able to take my skills and be, be able to apply them and put them to work for the people of Guam. I'm very grateful to Speaker Pangolinan in the Office of Finance and Budget and my colleagues for allowing me to involve myself as much as I did and to allow me to contribute the skills that I have in service of our people. This budget, Madam Speaker, that the governor vetoed is a very, very good budget. And I'm saying that with my financial management hat on because it not only provisions for a lot of things that are important in our community, but it does so in a way that's responsible. It does so in a way that uses smart financial management tools. And it does so in a way that's very, very conservative. Yes, this budget that we passed is conservative. It's a conservative budget. And the reason why it is is because we don't factor in any of the economic multipliers that are, gonna call, that are, gonna, that are going to take effect when this budget becomes law. We have many, many good things in this budget that's going to result in more consumer spending. For the first time in maybe a generation, we're going to see a massive economic boom that is going to be consumer driven by our local people. Those kinds of consumer driven growth 
are the most powerful and sustainable in any community. We can bring in as much money outside as we want, but it's what we circulate inside that counts the most. And that's what this budget is going to do. We didn't factor in the economic multiplier effect into the budget and spend that. All of that is gonna be extra on top of what's already been identified. And that extra money that comes in is gonna be more money for the governor to manage. Because the way it works is when cash comes in above and beyond what was projected, it goes right into the cash balances of the books and he's able to expense that for whatever he feels are additional priorities. So not only does this budget meet many, many important needs, it's very conservative in its intentions to do so. And so I wanted to kind of go line item by line item, Madam Speaker, and all the different objections from the governor, because I think it's important for us to address them head on. And in the first objection by the governor, the governor says that the legislature lumped funding for health agencies together, carved out appropriations for various programs, and then left the balance for operations, which is 3.7 million short of what the health agencies need to operate. Madam Speaker, I don't know where he's getting that from because the budget that we passed and gave to him is the kind of budget that every governor has been dying for over the many different governors that we've had in the past. We gave him a lump sum budget. He has $129 million to figure out where he wants to prioritize. We didn't tell him go spend 100 million here and 29 million there. We said here's 129 million Governor, you can set the priorities. But in his objection here, he's saying we're, sh we're selling health short, and that's just not the case. Because if we were doing that, then that means that we would have itemized that 129 million and purposely shortchanged health. We didn't do that. We gave him 129 million, and if he wants to put all 129 million into health, that's up to him. He needs to do his job and manage the money. Don't create these fake shortfalls just to justify what you want. It's not always going to be what you want. It has to be what's good for the people. The second point uses the same argument, and he says that we're gonna be also shortchanging public safety the same way. But again, we gave him the lump sum budget. He says we're shortchanging them by 6.7 million. He has 129. And if he can't manage 129 million to meet the priorities of this government, then he's not doing his job. We are giving him the resources and a tremendous amount of flexibility that every governor previous to this governor would have loved to have. He then says that because we're shortchanging these agencies, that's what we're using to fund the hay and the cola. And that's not true at all, Madam Speaker. To fund the hay, what we've done is we've said, you know what? The government is operating right now, it's doing pretty good. We're not going to fill the vacancies. We're not going to fill the vacancies and where we save in not filling those vacancies, we're going to give it as the, finally we're going to give it, as the pay adjustment to the employees who are currently working. And Madam Speaker, this is very, very responsible in two ways. First, if you fill all those vacancies and then pay hay, it's gonna be far more expensive than what it is right now but because there's nobody sitting in those positions, we're not having to give a higher salary to a vacant, a vacant seat. It's very irresponsible to try and fill positions and then do a pay adjustment. It is very responsible to do a pay adjustment first and then from there go forward and say, you know what, we do have a couple vacancies now, let's see how we can fill them with this new salary level. But it's wrong to try and fill vacancies and then adjust salaries. And it's wrong for a second reason, Madam Speaker, it's wrong because it's so grossly unfair to our hardworking employees, the ones who are currently working right now. Madam Speaker, there's an employee right now sitting at a desk doing the people's work, and perhaps there's a vacancy right next to that person. And if we tell that employee, we don't have money to adjust your salary the way it should be, and then all of a sudden, somebody with the right last name or the right political connections walks in as a new hire and sits in the seat right next to them, green as grass, and that person not only has to do their work but has to train this person, they're gonna look at that person and say, I thought there was no money for my salary adjustment, but there's money to hire this person right here next to me while I've been doing this person's work and my work and I deserve my pay adjustment? How wrong is that, Madam Speaker? 
to say, I'm not going to pay you what you're worth because I want to go on a hiring spree because the election's coming up. We were responsible in saying we want to pay our people what they're worth because we understand that this isn't a budget about politics. This is about treating people fairly. And the first and most important thing to do is pay people for the hard work that they've been doing, pay them as much as we can for the hard work that they've been doing, and not insult them by saying there's not enough money, but oh, we're going to go and fill all these vacancies because I want to get elected next year. That's the easy road to take, Madam Speaker. The hard road to take is the responsible one, to adjust salaries while there are vacancies so that we can realize what the numbers are going forward and not go overboard when we're going to start hiring again. If we fill all those vacancies, the hay will be even more unaffordable going forward. So anyone who wants to say, let's do a little bit here and let me hire all over over here, that little bit is all it's going to be. And then we come to the COLA. Again, Paying the COLA is not just stuffing money into somebody's pocket and playing popular. These retirees shared in the sacrifices of our people by directly having less to live on since 2008. And we're not saying we're going to go and give more COLA. We're saying we're just going to put it back to where it was. And from 2008 to today, things have gotten even more expensive. The retirees are being so gracious to say that they're not asking for an inflation-adjusted increase in their COLA because the reality is prices have gone up since 2008. Going back to 1800 today is still going backwards from 1800 and 2008 because prices are higher. But they are being gracious enough. Our retirees, our manamku, are being gracious enough to say, you know what, boy, just take us back to where we were. I know prices are higher, but just take us back to where we were. And we have the money for that. We have the money to make them whole. We always say they're our greatest generation. We have the money to make them whole. And it's not giving them more. It's giving them just what they had. The governor then starts going in the same direction that he's been going over the, since I, take, I took office, where he says one thing. And then he says something else entirely that doesn't make any sense. First, he says, we can't afford it. And then he says, oh, by the way, you didn't fund the hay for unclassified employees. And he says, oh, we need to do that. Mr. Governor, which one is it? Do you want to fund hay or do you not? If you want to fund hay, then that's what we're doing. If you don't, then why are you saying do it for the unclassifieds? And I would like to remind everybody that the governor did not include the unclassified employees in his original budget for any hay adjustment. So for him to now come out and say, oh, you forgot about them, Governor, the, for the forgetting started with you. This entire budget was based around the priorities that we realized are current and that we also acknowledge in the budget that you sent down. So don't say that we're forgetting a group because you didn't include them to begin with. And this one here, Madam Speaker, number five, just really gets me, it really gets me, because it's the same thing. It's the governor saying one thing and then saying another, not being consistent, trying to spin it to suit his objectives. He says that if we use a line of credit for merit bonuses, we're going to put our credit rating at risk. We're going to go on credit watch by Standard & Poor's. It's irresponsible, irrational, and beyond comprehension because it's used to fund operations. Madam Speaker. This governor, over and over and over again, said that merit bonuses are not operational expenses. They're prior year obligations. That's how he went out and paid them over the last 12 months, because he didn't have an appropriation for it. He did have authorization to pay prior year obligations, and that's what he said they were, prior year obligations. Now, we've borrowed before to pay prior year obligations. We borrowed 30 times as much for 30 years to pay tax refunds, and that didn't sink our credit rating. You can borrow to pay prior year obligations. So for the governor to say one minute merit bonuses are prior year obligations so that I can take the money and spend it and be popular while I'm treating DOE and the judiciary unfairly, and then for us to come back to the table and say, Governor, here's a tool that you can use, a financial management tool that you can use to treat DOE and the judiciary fairly, and for him to come back and say, I can't do that. It's an operational expense. Governor, which one is it? 
Is it a priority obligation or an operational expense? You gotta figure your language out because we're talking about people's lives here and we're talking about basic fairness. And further on the line of credit, you know, the governor likes to try and paint a, paint a picture that this is just more borrowing, deficit spending. No, it's not, Mr. Governor. And maybe you need to commit some of your office budget to go and hire somebody with more financial experience because this line of credit isn't just sinking us into debt, it's a financial management tool that marries fiscal years to calendar years. Because if we, collect, if we pay out the merit bonus before December, using a line of credit, we get the money in, we pay it all out by December, we're going to recover all of that expense through income taxes this April, which means we spend it in December to recover up to 20% of it in April so that it doesn't adversely affect the fiscal year. You see, if you just take money and pay merit bonuses over 12 months, you're not gonna recover it in the current fiscal year. You recover a portion of it, whatever you paid out before December, but everything after that is going into the next fiscal year. So if we want to do this as smartly as possible, using the financial management tools that are available to us, that this legislature in this budget is going to make available to the governor to finally treat DOE and the judiciary fairly, if he just uses it, we're going to benefit up to 20% of a discount on the total cost. Now the real question becomes, well, how are we gonna pay that off? And that, the answer to that's very simple. And that is answered in item six here. He answers his own problem. If he really was just solutions oriented, instead of trying to be so heavy handed and forcing his way, he would see that the solutions are right in his own objections. Because in item six, he says we've over provisioned for tax refunds. We set aside $120 million to pay for tax refunds. He's saying he only needs 107. Well, I can do some simple math, Madam Speaker. 120 minus 107 is 13 million. So if you do have $13 million more in refunds than you actually needed, guess what you can do, Mr. Governor? You can take that 13 million and you can use it to pay off the line of credit. So if your numbers are accurate, you're gonna be able to wipe that thing out before the end of the fiscal year. Now, I don't understand why he doesn't acknowledge that. I don't understand why there's all these bends and twists and reshaping and flipping upside down to just try and make your case and get your way. We can really help our people with this budget, and yet you're trying to find all of these conflicting reasons to say no. He goes on to talk about lockbox provisions, which I'm not too familiar with because I never remember voting on locking something up. I do remember voting on giving him a, a lump sum budget, and that's something that's very, very important. So I do have more that I'd like to go into, Madam Speaker, in terms of the, who, who all is going to benefit from this budget that we passed and where we can find even more money. But I understand that you would like me to, at this time, defer my discussion. Do you like me to continue, Madam Speaker? I have more that I'd like to share, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be very quick. So I can go ahead and, and, de and defer, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'll yield my time to the gentleman. All of it. Point of order, Madam Speaker. It has been called that the, it has been told to me that the Xerox copies for the governor's bill has been completed and are waiting. And I'd just like to note for the record that we, uh, section 1423H of the Organic Act states that the governor may call a special session of the legislature at any time. In his opinion, the public interest may require it. Require it. Thank you, Senator. And also, Madam Speaker, under Mason's Section 780, the governor has the power to call a special session while the legislature is in general session. Madam Speaker, as you stated earlier, it's never been our intent to uh, disrespect the governor. Yes, so I, I would like yes. to defer my, uh, my discussion okay. so yes. that we can, then, now that the, the Xerox copies are ready, like you stated, we can go ahead and address the governor's concerns. Okay, so that, but, uh, yeah, so we're, well, the motion then was to send it down to the voting file, so.
The motion was to place the bill in the uh, voting file, which is a daily calendar, Madam Speaker, and once the legislature cannot suspend action on the daily calendar. So we're in voting file now. We need to vote on what is in the daily calendar, and then we can recess. Madam Speaker, we can recess and then do the business of the governor and then come back and vote what's on the calendar. Point of order, Madam but Madam Speaker. Speaker, I believe that we are, this legislature, this body is in violation of the Organic Act, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Sen and Senator. And the House Rules, Madam Speaker. Uh, Senator, Majority Leader, you recognize. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm just trying to follow what is it the, our colleagues want here on the right side of the aisle. Uh, they've been asking time and time again to call for the question. And now when, uh, when it suits their needs, it seems like they want to not only thwart discussion on this very important piece of legislation, uh, they, want, they walked out, then they came back, then they called for the question, then they tried to recess. And so now, because they've been asking time and time again to call for the question, I say we, we continue with the course of um, the, the daily calendar, and then we go to the voting file, we dispose of this matter, then we can address the governor's call to special session. Now, once again, Madam Speaker, point of order. We call for the, the question many times, to, back, and forth, back and forth, back and, and we, had, we had the discussions on there. We need to go and Senator, comply with okay, the call your, of the governor to your, session. Your objections is uh, well taken. Uh, so on the motion then to send it down to the voting file, there is an objection, so I'm going to call for the vote to, to send the uh, vetoed bill uh, 38 to the voting file. Please raise your hand for it to go down to the voting file. Okay, it carries. So it's down to the voting file. I'm going to ask the clerk then to please uh, read the title of the bill, notwithstanding the veto bill, notwithstanding the governor's objection. Vetoed Bill Number 38-32 COR, an act making appropriations for the operations of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the Government of Guam for fiscal year ending September 30th, 2014, making other appropriations and establishing mis miscellaneous and administrative provisions. Roll call. Senator Tom Adda. Senator Tom Adda, aye. Senator Tony Adda. Senator Tony Adda, out doing roll call. Senator Uggen. Senator Uggen, excused. Vice Speaker Cruz. Aye. Vice Speaker Cruz, aye. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, out during roll call. Senator Limtiaco. Senator Limtiaco out during roll call. Senator McCready. Senator McCready out during roll call. Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison out during roll call. Senator Munya Barnes. Senator Munya Barnes, aye. Senator Pangolinen. Senator Pangolinen, aye. Senator Respicio. Yes. Senator Respicio, aye. Senator Rodriguez. Senator Rodriguez, aye. Senator Sinicholas. Yes. Senator Sinicholas, aye. Speaker Wampat. Okay. Speaker Wampat, aye. Senator Yamashita. Pass. Senator Yamashita, pass. Senator Yamashita. Senator Tony Adda. Senator Tony Adda out during roll call. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas out during roll call. Senator Limtiaco. Senator Limtiaco out during roll call. Senator McCready. Senator McCready out during roll call. Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison out during roll call.
Senator Yamashita. Senator Yamashita, pass. Senator Tony Ada. Senator Tony Ada, nay. Senator Duenas. Senator Duenas, nay. Senator Limtiaco. Senator Limtiaco, nay. Senator McCready. Senator McCready, nay. Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison, nay. Senator Yamashita. Senator Yamashita, nay. Point of order, uh, Madam Speaker, before you announce the vote. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, uh, the situation is that there are some senators who left the hall and they refused to vote. So instead of listing them as a nay vote, I think it'd be more appropriate in the rules to just notate them as refused to vote or an unexcused absence. Normally, if uh, a member, of course, is off island uh, or ill, then there's the request for uh, them to be excused if they're away from here. But um, in this case, when a member is visibly, of course, um, in this uh, legislature, then you're right, it could be, be either one. They they're, they refuse to vote to come in because one member has stayed. and and has uh, stated you know, her position versus the others who refuse to vote. So uh, what's the pleasure of yeah, the body? So the out both situations can't necessitate right. the same outcome. So I think it should be reflected that they refuse to vote. And it'd be an unexcused absence. So the, so the, motion then basically said you're right because normally there's a motion to excuse and in this case the motion then would be uh, vice speaker man speaker yesterday when um i was here for one vote and then i left the rest of my votes were i thought were reported as Well, let me, uh, on the uh, standing rules, it says declining to vote. Perhaps when, we should recess right now, Madam well, Speaker? Can I just read the, these two so that everybody would understand? Declining to vote, when it's, and that's in the standing rules, uh, page 19. When a senator declines or fails to vote when that member's name is called, the member shall be required without debate to assign that member's reasons therefore and having assigned them, the speaker shall submit that question to the legislature. However, now there's the other section A, failing to vote. If a member fails to vote for a period of over two minutes or passes or refuses to vote for more than three consecutive times after the member's name is called, the member shall be construed as declining to vote and the member's vote shall be entered as a nay vote by the clerk of the legislature unless the member is excused from voting pursuant to section 1.02 G6 supra. If any member refuses to vote after being ordered to by the body, that member's vote shall be entered as a nay vote by the clerk of the legislature. 
So, okay, so Madam Speaker, so given that there should be two things, uh, that the vote be registered as a nay vote, but it be asterisk, the member refuses to vote. Madam Speaker, I'd also like to uh, make sure that we make that amendment to yesterday's session as well, as the Vice Speaker was not present during several of the bills. Point and I order. don't believe there was a motion for uh, an excused yeah. absence. Point of order, again, the gentleman demonstrates his uh, lack of understanding of our process. I'll, I'll be able to clarify again. When the Vice Speaker uh, needed to do something, I got up, you recognized me, and I moved that he be excused, and his absence was excused. And therefore, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't vote at all on those particular measures. Yes, uh, that, and we that adjourned that session, so we don't go back once we adjourn a session. Yes, that is correct, and the clerk just verified that he was excused. Uh, point of order, Madam Speaker. You our our standing rule states that if a voter doesn't vote, uh, a member doesn't vote, that it becomes a nay vote. It doesn't say that an asterisk will be placed that uh, they're, they, uh, they were abs out, out, out for the vote. In the, um, in the um, roster here, the voting uh, sheet, then what, what the clerks normally do when they call down for the three, they put a, an indication, a mark, in terms of the, that the first vote was called, the second time they were called, and then the third time. I understand, so, Madam. So that, it's not an asterisk, but in this case, it's a check right, mark. Right, that it becomes an A vote, but also another point of order, Madam Speaker, that the clerk failed to give the two minutes allowed per in between each vote. Madam Speaker, I motion to recess. I, I understand, uh, Senator, where, where you're coming from, but uh, I mean, two, two minutes if we're going to do the two minutes, so. Madam Speaker, to, I motion to recess. But, no, wait, I'm going to have to report the vote out. So veto, notwithstanding the objections of uh, the, the governor and vetoed bill number 38-32, the votes are eight yeas, three, I mean, one nay, five out during roll call, which, uh, Understanding rules is a nay vote and one excused absence. So, Madam Speaker, bill point of order. I, I'd just like to find out what's. Wait, can I finish, please? Thank you. Uh, vetoed bill, then, notwithstanding the objection of the governor, um, has failed to pass. Okay. Madam Speaker, if I may ask, which member was excused? Uh, Senator Frank Ogun. And that was uh, asked earlier in, in the. So on a motion, Senator Respicio, you recognize. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I move that we uh, recess this um, regular session uh, only to uh, recognize the governor's call to special session. On that motion, without any objections, supported. Okay.